thanks for inviting me to talk here today. Um, so I want to talk about, I, I guess, an event that really grabbed the attention of the world um, a little under six weeks ago, uh, which was this huge explosive eruption of this volcano in Tonga that not much is known about. Um, and I guess it grabbed the attention of the world because of some of the incredible images that have been coming out from satellites and from eyewitness accounts where, for example, you can see this image here, which shows Australia over here, New Zealand down on the bottom. And this is the huge plume that generated, uh, that was generated from this big eruption from this volcano. Um, and volcanologists across the world have been extremely interested in this because it's got a whole bunch of features uh, and phenomena from this eruption, which haven't been witnessed really before. Um, in modern instrumental times, but it's also grabbed the attention of scientists from all different walks of life, uh, atmospheric scientists, tsunami scientists. Um, it's a really fascinating event. Um, so what I want to do today is talk about, or put the volcano into context and talk about uh, a trip that I did to the volcano in 2015 with um, colleagues from the University of Auckland, particularly uh, Shane Cronin, and Marco Brenner, who's now at Otago. Uh, we went with a bunch of people from Auckland and also the Tongan Geological um, Service. And uh, I guess since the eruption, we've been working with uh, these people and a bunch of people from across the world, uh, particularly the uh, United States Geological Survey, NASA, and a whole bunch of different people. Um, I also wanted to emphasize before I get into too much detail uh, that I'm gonna talk about this eruption with, I guess, quite a bit of enthusiasm. But I guess we need to keep in the back of our minds that uh, this is an event that has really affected a lot of people. It's claimed people's lives. Uh, people in Tonga have been really, um, uh, there's been a huge amount of damage and they've been really uh, impacted by this eruption. Um, so although it's fascinating in terms of the geology, you've always got to keep in the back of your mind that this has really impacted on people. Um, and I've learned a lot being involved with the response of this eruption. We've tried to help out as much as we can by analyzing uh, ash coming in for um, leachate analysis to give advice around uh, the, the um, toxicity of the, the water coming off for, um, for drinking water, for agriculture. Um, we've been trying to get some initial results on what the magma chemistry is to try and get an idea of uh, what may happen next essentially. Um, so I've, I've learned a huge amount and it's been a really fascinating process. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the area, um, Hunga is located uh, in the Tonga Arc, which is sort of an extension of the Kermadec Tonga Arc, about 2,000 kilometers uh, northeast of New Zealand. Uh, in this particular segment of the arc, the Tofu Arc, um, is a line of volcanoes, which result from subduction of the um, Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate. Really a high subduction rate in this area, 20 centimeters a year, um, quite a unique area and that forms this, this chain of volcanoes, which is actually offset from the main ridge, which most of the islands and most of the people live on in Tonga, um, particularly in Tonga Tapu and the, the capital Nukalofa down here, uh, which are sort of coral um, base uh, islands. Uh, and these islands have um, soils on top of them and ashes that are generated from eruptions from this arc and obviously below uh, from the dominant uh, westerlies over to, towards the mainland. So Hung is just one of many volcanoes along this arc. Um, there's a whole uh, bunch that have erupted in uh, historic times. Uh, and you can see this is a, a blown up version of Hunger, which is just represented by these two little uh, outcrops of rock at the surface, but it's just part of a much larger volcano. It goes down to about 1800 meters uh, rises up, sorry, from about 1,800 meters water depth. So it's a, it's a big volcano. Um, and it's got an unusual flat top. Um, not much is really known about it because there's hardly any of it exposed. It's had uh, small eruptions throughout the 20th century, mostly observed from uh, fishermen and planes going over. Um, and it's had some um, sort of decent size eruptions uh, in, in modern times. And I guess one of the important questions is, is Hunga being so close to Tonga Tapu one of the potential sources for some of these quite thick tephra units that um, are found uh, on Tonga Tapu, which sort of up to half a meter thick, so quite big eruptions. So uh, people have worked on this, um, particularly Shane Cronin, who's worked in some of the, the um, tephras on Tonga Tapu, and this is one of the big questions is they just don't know where these are coming from. So 
um, looking at uh, the volcano from space, it's nothing spectacular. It's just these two little islands that outcrop, or it was these two little islands that outcrop. Uh, and the name of the islands were Hunga Ha'apai on the west and Hunga Tonga on the east, about 100 metres or so high and a couple of kilometres long. So I guess the first eruption that I'll mention, there's been a bunch through the 20th century, but uh, the 2009 eruption um, was of particular note because it had some spe spectacular images coming from uh, fishermen in the area. And you can see these classic Surtsean jets coming out from uh, multiple vents. So this map up here just shows uh, Hunga Ha'apai and Hunga Tonga, and the vents were along this lineation just south of uh, Hunga Ha'apai and on the western side of the island too. Uh, and it was about a month long uh, eruption in, in March, and it formed a small tuff cone on the southern uh, edge of Ha'apai. And this was rapidly eroded away. You can see on the satellite image here, uh, there's a huge amount of sediment coming off this area. Uh, some people landed on the island. For some reason, they played golf. Um, and uh, yeah, it was impressive, but not a huge eruption. And there's not much evidence for it afterwards because most of it eroded away. So this is a satellite image of pre-2014, 2015. Um, compared with 2008, you can see there's just a little bit of uh, ash and sediment on the edges of Ha'apai here. So that's all that was really left in terms of evidence of that eruption. Then in December 2014, uh, people actually noticed from the mainland uh, steam and uh, something going on. Uh, and this um, satellite image shows that there was new activity which was actually in between the two islands, um, quite a, a decent amount of steam coming off. And that marked the onset of the 2014-2015 eruption. Again, it was classic Surtsean style jets. Um, it was a lot more energetic uh, because you have more magma coming in. Um, and you can see these, these time sequences show how impressive these, these eruptions are um, with some base surges. And it actually ended up forming this island uh, between the two pre-existing older islands. Um, but again, it, it didn't cause any problems in Tongatapu. Um, people noticed uh, some of the plume um, and there was a lot of interest. People were going up and taking photos and bits and pieces, but didn't have any sort of longer lasting impacts. But what it did do was form this decent sized new, uh, well, I guess it wasn't an island because it was actually attached to Hanga Ha'apai, um, but a decent uh, new cone. So this is in January 2015, after most of the activity had, um, had waned down. And then over the course of that year, uh, the cone eroded and the sediment drifted along and hit Hunga Tonga and formed a tombolo, which linked up uh, the three islands. And that's really interesting because it's kind of the first time in which it's now allowed access to both volcano, uh, to both pre-existing islands that were quite hard to access before because they were just rocky uh, islands. So a huge amount of erosion is going on. So some quite impressive satellite images coming off. So after I finished my PhD, I got a three-year postdoc at the University of Auckland. Um, and my office mate, Marco, uh, this guy up here in the, the left-hand corner, um, put in a uh, internal faculty grant, um, which is kind of like a guaranteed grant you get as like a new staff member. Uh, to pay for a trip for us to go to this new island that had formed so we could document uh, the eruptive uh, history of the volcano by accessing the older islands and also document the 2014-2015 eruption itself in terms of the eruptive products and the erosion and bits and pieces. So we went to the island uh, for a little under a week. Uh, we camped um, uh, close to the uh, Hunga Tonga. It's our campsite there. And we essentially scoured the volcano, we went all around the sides. Uh, we took a, um, a fishing boat, which was essentially chartered, um, and we mapped all around the outside uh, of the volcano too. Um, and we went with colleagues from the Tongan Geological Service, and we also had a film crew with us, with the idea that uh, they were gonna make a trailer that was then go, going to go to BBC uh, to make a documentary and hopefully fund more research there. Um, so it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it got us to the island and it got us equipment, um, drones and bits and pieces to take there to, to document the new volcano. Um, so this is an image taken from the drone uh, and you can see uh, the impressive erosion and the rilling and the structure of that, that new cone. 
our campsite is just off the edge down here. And so that, that new um, barrier allowed us to access Hangatonga. Um, so we went all along the edges of, of the cliff line and sampled um, what were uh, older stacked um, lavas and some small pyroclastic surges. So these are, this is sort of the, the remnants of an old volcano that was there. Um, we had no idea how old it was and um, what it really represented. Um, so we tried to sample as best we could. There's some interesting evidence on Hunga Tonga um, for uplift. We found corals about 10 meters above the high tide line, which must have been uplifted quite recently for them to have not eroded away. Um, so there's been some interesting things going on prior to that 2014-2015 uh, eruption. Uh, Hanga Ha'apai, the island on the opposite side, uh, was a lot more impacted from the 2014-2015 eruption. It was covered in quite a bit of ash. Um, so at first it was quite hard to try and tell what was going on. Um, but uh, we essentially went around the edges with the boat and, and took photos all along. You could actually get up onto the ridge line and um, get down into the coves and sample uh, the 2009 eruption products that were all nicely in the stratigraphy there. Um, it's quite different to Hunga Tonga. There's a lot more um, of a pyroclastic succession on top of the lava dominated succession. And within that pyroclastic succession are uh, welded ignimbrites. Um, so these are pyroclastic flows that are so hot they're welded back together. Um, so we've sampled uh, that pyroclastic session and the welded ignimbrite as well as the lava um, succession to try and compare with uh, Hunga Tonga. It was really interesting at the base of some of the pyroclastic flows, we found charcoal, which was really great because then we could start uh, dating these events. It's surprisingly young. Um, the charcoal came back at about 1,100 years old, which perfectly coincides with uh, one of the half meter thick tephras on Tongatapu. Um, so that's starting to tell us that this volcano might have had a much more violent history than, than what we sort of anticipated. So part of my role on the trip was to um, do the bathymetry. So we had our um, chartered fishing boat and we essentially mowed the lawns back and forward um, just on the edge of the volcano. We took with us a little multi-beam unit. There was a company in Auckland that we worked with called WASP and they have generated these little portable units that you can use on mostly on commercial fishing boats to really nicely image the sea floor. And we attached this to the side of the boat um, and had to do a, a little bit of MacGyver work to make it uh, all stable and attach to the side without it flopping around. And it seemed to work quite nicely, actually. Um, and yeah, we um, managed to do the bathymetry uh, right up to the edges because we we're in quite a small boat. Uh, and we uncovered some pretty interesting features. Um, we found multiple vents uh, to the south of the 2009 vents. Um, some craters that coincide with where activity was seen in 1988, um, some dome features, but it also really nicely showed this um, caldera structure, which is in the middle of uh, between the 2014-15 cone and also these reefs that are off to the south. Um, and of course, you know, mowing the lawns, going back and forward, why not pop the fishing rod out the back and try and catch some dinner so you don't need to eat two-minute noodles every night. And we managed to have tuna almost every single night. So that was, that was a nice byproduct of the, of the um, bathymetry. And so a fascinating sort of a discovery moment where we just went back and forth and revealed these different um, features at the same time as doing the work on land and, and seeing this evidence for a violent uh, eruptive history. So I, I guess this figure kind of summarizes uh, what we think uh, the features of the volcano are and the bathymetry. Is this caldera structure in the middle where the um, older islands, Hunga Tonga and Hunga Ha'apai, represent um, sort of the edges of what was probably once a much larger um, cone that then collapsed in during a pretty decent sized eruption about uh, a thousand years ago. Um, so uh, I guess a good analogy is something like uh, Crater Lake in the US where you have a huge eruption that uh, caves in the top part of uh, a cone to form a caldera. Um, so thick welded pyroclastic flows plus caldera equals a big eruption. So that was kind of the main findings of that trip were, wow, we've revealed a lot more than what we thought we were gonna find. Um, and so we wrote this up for an article um, in 
EOS um, and it was just a nice sort of post trip. Look, here are our thoughts. This has had some big eruptions uh, and we tried to sell it to the um, film company and it didn't get selected for funding. I don't know if they're kicking themselves now. Um, so we didn't end up going back to the volcano to do more work. Um, we did a heap of work in a week. Um, you know, one night our tents got blown away and it was, it was quite an extreme trip, um, but it was a lot of fun and a really incredible um, voyage. So after that trip, I guess um, Marco in particular worked on the geochemistry of the eruptive products from the 2014-15 eruption, from also the 2009 that we could collect from the side of Hunga Ha'apai, and also from the older um, pyroclastics and lava flows uh, on the edges of the old um, islands. And essentially, uh, th these diagrams just show the, the range in chemistry, uh, the light pink, uh, the older pyroclastics, which are slightly more evolved, getting up into sort of andesite, uh, about 60% silica, the 2014, 15, and 2009 uh, eruptive products are almost identical chemistry. Um, they're slightly less evolved than the older pyroclastics. And then the lavas that make up the, the oldest part of the sequence uh, show quite a range of, of, of compositions um, from andesite all the way down to basaltic andesite. Um, so it, it was quite interesting comparing that with other volcanoes in the area. It's slightly more evolved than most of the volcanoes in the area but it's very homogeneous um, andesites. Uh, this just shows the compositions through the stratigraphy uh, and with the oldest lavas on the bottom, the pyroclastic flow units here in the middle and the 2009, 2014, 15 eruption products, it's just phosphorus and titanium, just to look at the variation in magma chemistry. And what we interpret these lineations with is some kind of rejuvenation events of, of this older cone that then eventually led to a more evolved system and a big caldera eruption. And since then, these post caldera uh, er, eruptions have been almost identical in chemistry and, and not really much variation through time. So what we interpreted this was um, the, the building up of this andesitic reservoir and this coalescence of um, what were small little um, basaltic andesite uh, uh, shallow reservoirs beforehand coalesced to form this much larger system uh, that then uh, erupted with caldera formation. And then since that, uh, the system has been essentially rebuilding and you're having these small leaks of identical uh, chemistry magma coming up along uh, different parts uh, of the volcano to form the 2009 eruption, the 2014-15. And I guess we kind of interpret the 1988 eruption on the southern side to potentially be from the same reservoir, although we don't have material from that. So. We wrote this up for an article in Lithos. Um, it kind of took a few years to pull it all together and um, Marco had since moved down to Otago. So we kind of slowly pulled it together and it came together as quite a nice paper. So this paper was accepted in December, 2021. Um, and right at the time when it was accepted, um, so this is the article itself here, which actually didn't come out online until I think February, even, even though we were kind of really asking them to get it online as fast as they could because of the eruptions. Um, coinciding with this time was the, uh, was the eruption in um, December, 2021, on around the 20th of de December. So it started with a similar eruptive styles that we had observed uh, in 2014, 2015, dominantly Sertsayan, um, but it became a lot more vigorous um, with time. And I, I mean, we were really fascinated by this because it just perfectly coincided with when we had published this paper saying, oh, it could be potentially building back up to another decent sized eruption, which, uh, you know, when you think about it in terms of the geology, you, you know, you're thinking much longer time scale, you're not thinking next week. Um, so it was really fascinating. Uh, and these satellite images just show um, the, where the new activity was, it was slightly offset towards the, the Northeast. Um, so this image here on January 7th, uh, I think our campsite was almost directly under this new vent uh, here, so our campsite was no longer, uh, but it started to, to modify um, the island once again. It was quite fascinating looking at these images coming in through time. Things really ramped up uh, on the 14th of January. Um, there was a pretty decent plume up to about 17 kilometers. Uh, you can still see from these images of these Sertsayan jets coming out. There's just a lot more material coming in here. Um, then 
on the 15th of January, here's a satellite image uh, of the volcano. And you can see that the essentially the cone in the middle here had now gone underwater. So that it had essentially either gone underwater and disappeared from subsidence or had been destroyed from the decent sized eruptions. Um, so this, this eruption was quite well observed in Tongatapu. There was lightning, um, there was a lot of activity. So it kind of got people thinking, oh, you know, maybe this is actually capable of, of, of bigger eruptions um, because you know, up until now, they've been sort of minor in, in size. Uh, the Tongan Geological Service went there on the 14th of January um, and observed they don't have any monitoring equipment on the islands. In fact, I don't think there's a single seismometer in all of Tonga. Um, so they don't have a huge amount of resources, um, but they did an incredible job of, of essentially warning people about the, the hazards from this eruption. So you can see uh, people from the Geological Service observing this eruption the day before the really big event. Uh, and this video here just shows um, in Tongatapu, there was some interesting um, tides, essentially. Uh, and this attracted people down to the waterfront. Uh, and people were amazed, saying, oh, you know, what's going on? And the Tongan Geological Service said, don't go down to the water. There could be a tsunami if there's a bigger eruption. This is a good opportunity to make sure you have a good evacuation plan. Uh, and yeah, it was it was quite incredible to watch this um, all from the side. So this a lot of this was covered uh, on the Tongan news website, the Tangi Tonga. Uh, and then the next day, this happened. In the evening, there was a very large series of explosions and formed this very large umbrella cloud. These are ten minute. Uh, shots from satellite um, and you can see the huge size of this plume this is whole globe perspective at sunset you had that massive umbrella cloud uh, forming there's a cyclone heading down towards New Zealand um, just just absolutely fascinating something we really didn't expect from this from this volcano so here's a closer image showing the development let me just rewind here uh, so this is the first activity at about um, six minutes past four UTC. You can see 10 minute snapshots on how rapidly that umbrella cloud is growing. Uh, that umbrella cloud is sitting at about 35 kilometers height. Uh, the overshooting top of the plume actually went up to close to 50, 55 kilometers. It's the highest plume ever um, documented. It's really incredible. So those are the 10 minute shots uh, with the satellite going into radar. Sorry, sorry, this is the closer image. Yep, there we go. So this is a closer image and you can see that's Tongatapu down there in the blue. You see the huge size of this plume. It's getting up to 600 kilometers across. It's absolutely, absolutely gigantic. Sorry, I'll just fast forward to here. Uh, then you can see the minute shots once the satellites realized something was going on. They focused the satellites, we've got proper radar. Uh, over the umbrella cloud, and you can see this is later on during the eruption, the umbrella cloud's still growing though. You can see these gravity waves feeding into the umbrella cloud and the extreme resolution, these incredible images that are coming out um, and that umbrella cloud covering that whole area. It's just absolutely gigantic and that's the top of the plume being sheared off. Um, so to put this into perspective, um, we've plotted up the radius of the umbrella cloud with time after the start of the eruption. Um, so if you have a higher eruption rate, it will form an umbrella cloud much faster and much larger. Uh, so for example, I've put on here the growth of the Pinatubo umbrella cloud, which is a, a, um, a very well-known eruption. And this shows hunger for the first hour, hour and a half uh, after the start of the eruption. So it had a much more powerful umbrella cloud than Pinatubo. So from this, we're calculating mass eruption rates, which are about uh, five times 10 to the nine kilograms per second, which is just phenomenal. It's very, very, very high eruption rate. To get the kind of eruption rate that you'd expect from like a caldera forming eruption, these are really, really high numbers. Um, and that evening in Tonga, you can see from this video, rocks started falling. These are big, Paraclass, these are you know a few centimeters in size, some of them up to sort of marble size that are falling in Tongatapu. And Tongatapu is 65 to 70 kilometers away. So that's very, very impressive that um, 
you know, class this bigger falling uh, that far from vent. This is slightly later on. You can see the ash accumulating on the ground, really fresh. It's very, very coarse. Um, so just incredible eyewitness accounts coming out of Tongatapu. So what did this look like from the ground to compare with the satellite images? Uh, we just got these images last week um, from a, um, a fisherman in uh, Tongatapu. He was out on his boat just north east of Tongatapu at the time of the eruption and started seeing the, the, the growth of this plume. So he's time stamped this and he's given us the exact GPS coordinates, which is just really, really valuable when trying to piece back together what actually happened. So this shows uh, the plume at 11 minutes past um, five or 11 minutes past four UTC time. Um, and you can see that um, plume starting to develop. And what is amazing is how rapidly this changes. So five minutes later, that's the plume. This is the um, upper part of the plume going up into the stratosphere. Uh, this is, um, uh, I think, the freezing level. Uh, we're starting to form ice within the plume. This is one minute later. You can see that umbrella cloud's really starting to take shape now. Two more minutes later, you see how much growth has been. Just incredible that he's managed to get these images. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to mention that exactly at this time as well, there was a magnitude 5.8, uh, which coincides with the rapid increase in eruption rate, which we think represents some kind of flank collapse or some kind of um, collapse of the caldera. Uh, so 519, 525, this is um, about 20 minutes after the eruption started. This is the size of the umbrella cloud just rapidly expanding at about half past it covered Tongatapu. Um, and about a minute after this image was taken, uh, we've managed to tie down a source for the pressure wave um, that came out. Um, and so it's about 10 minutes after the magnitude 5.8 earthquake, the big pressure wave came out. And this, um, the skipper of this boat said that this hit him just after half past. So we managed to work out how much time it would take to travel um, from the volcano to him. And uh, he said it was very, very powerful. It was a very distinct uh, pressure wave. And just to give you an idea of what that sounded like, here's some eyewitness counts from Tongatapu. And hopefully the sound works on this because it's, it's quite incredible. You can see the umbrella cloud coming out over towards Tongatapu. Keep your eye on the branches of the trees just to see how much pressure change. That's not wind, that's the pressure from the blasts. And you know, people are really scared with what's going on. It's just gigantic explosions. Um, here's another shot. Keep an eye on the branch of the palm tree. It's sucked in, boom. So these pressure waves are incredibly powerful, incredible amount of energy. Um, required. Uh, they actually circulated the globe about three times. This is um, a pressure gauge from Iceland, on the other side of the globe. And you can see for three days, the pressure wave circulated around the globe. Um, so here's uh, another satellite view. And you can see that pressure wave moving out across the Pacific, interacting with different cloud systems, bouncing off the Andes and going all the way around the world. So an absolutely gigantic explosion, nothing we've ever seen before. So the other unique feature of this eruption was the incredible amount of lightning. I think it is the most amount of lightning or the most intense lightning ever observed in any kind of a natural system. Um, so these little flashes show the lightning. They show the lightning changing with the gravity waves coming out of the umbrella cloud over 200,000 strikes in the first hour. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. This plot over here shows lightning um, and which can be located um, for the exact location. And you can see uh, how widespread that lightning was uh, for the first part of the eruption. Uh, it died down quite a bit. This, is, this tells us really nicely how long the eruption was going on for. But this, is, this first part here is the really powerful part of the eruption and it died down slightly. Uh, and then the last bits of lightning was, were seen uh, not long 
at about 1500 UTC. Um, so it was powerful for the first part and then died off slightly. The other unique feature was the incredibly powerful tsunami waves. This is showing the tsunami waves hitting Tongatapu. Um, this is the first waves um, coming in. Uh, and yet the tsunami waves are, are, are really are a mystery because they uh, have quite, they're, they're very, very widespread for tsunami waves of volcanic origin, much more widespread than you'd expect with just a simple um, source. And uh, the tsunami waves are also, the arrival times are much faster than any models predicted. Um, so this map here just shows um, tsunami uh, arrival times. The arrival times are, I think, we're about 20 minutes faster arriving in Samoa uh, than the models predicted. And same thing in South America, where you had actually decent sized tsunami waves, it was 1.8 meters. Um, I think a few people died uh, in parts of Peru um, because this unexpected tsunami came through uh, and caused quite a bit of damage. Uh, in Northland and New Zealand, there was damage to the marina up there. Uh, in Japan, um, there's a meter tsunami, so incredibly widespread. Um, so the tsunami scientists are really interested in looking at this. Uh, the other interesting feature of, of the eruption was it actually generated a meteor tsunami in the Caribbean, 10 to 20 centimeter tsunami from the pressure wave hitting the ocean. Uh, so um, I think particularly in Japan, some of the tsunami scientists started to think that the um, tsunami waves may have been amplified by this pressure wave essentially interacting with the ocean and, 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 and amplifying the, um, the height and the speed of the tsunamis, which is just an incredible process to think about. So after the 15th, it became quite clear that there was a very big eruption and it had caused some widespread damage. Um, and when we started to get some images of the uh, island, um, it was quite clear that it had destroyed a large portion um, so the eruption was actually, you know, it was quite short-lived, especially the most powerful part. It was about two to three hours for the powerful part of the eruption. Um, and then it continued for six to seven hours, maybe up to 11 hours, if you allow for that last little bit of lightning. Um, when we've tried to reconstruct the amount of magma that was ejected in the eruption, we, we do this through um, Asheville modeling. Uh, so we try and recreate a model that predicts how much ash will fall in Tongatapu. And we're starting to get more ash thickness measurements from around Tonga, but the models are consistent with about a 0.5 to one cubic kilometer magma eruption. So a decent size, but it's not absolutely huge like caldera forming, um, but it did uh, cause a, a large amount of um, subsidence or destruction to the island. So this is a, a satellite image from November, 2021. And this is two days after the eruption. And you can see there's a bit of cloud still, uh, but you can see it's particularly Hunga Tonga. It's, been mostly destroyed or subsided. Um, we initially thought we could see up to about 10 meters of subsidence. Um, it's very hard to tell in some of the images because there's been quite a lot of scouring and direct damage. Um, but one really interesting feature that we started to really realize, especially on the um, satellite images after this that had less cloud, is you see this prominent feature of the, the reefs down here in the Southeast. Um, they seem to have completely disappeared. And this is, a, this is an image of the reefs that I took when I was doing the bathymetry. They're decent, they're lavas, and they're decent um, sized reefs. You know, they're a few meters above sea level and they cause waves crashing around this area. You can see sediment moving away from them. And then after the eruption, there's not even a single breaking wave in that area. No matter whatever radar we look on, we can't see any evidence for it. So we're starting to think that quite a large portion of the caldera may have um, subsided or, or collapsed. Um, and it may have been a flank collapse, sort of Mount St. Helens style, which moved off uh, to the south. Um, and then after that collapse, that opened up the opportunity to have a huge amount of water interaction with a large amount of magma, which caused what, the big explosion in the pressure wave. Um, this is consistent with uh, the um, communication cables being cut. So Tonga lost um, both the international and the domestic internet lines. Um, and we've tried to work out exactly when those were cut, uh, which is quite a challenge. Um, and it coincides with there potentially being a turbidite that moved about 70 kilometers from, from the volcano down towards Tonga Tapu and actually wiped out 
uh, the communication lines. That's something we're trying to work on. And they've actually just restored uh, communication, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, so just to briefly mention some of the impacts of the eruption, uh, almost all of Tonga has been hugely affected by this. Um, it, it's quite a big eruption. So um, of course there's gonna be impacts. Probably the most severe is a tsunami damage. Um, a lot of coastal buildings completely destroyed. It's quite, uh, it's really eye-opening to see um, the before and after images, particularly of small islands where um, the tsunami may have gone completely over the top. You know, people had to be on the roofs to avoid getting swept away. And some people did get swept away and had to try and get back. Um, Ashfall, uh, about two to three centimetres or so on Tonga Tapu. That varies quite a bit depending on place to place. And um, uh, we're trying to get some more measurements of that. Um, but there's some reports of up to six centimetres, um, which is bad for livestock and crops and fishing and agriculture and all sorts of things. Um, and of course, I just mentioned the communication has been really challenging, especially when you're, when you're trying to clean up and trying to ask for help. If you don't have that direct communication, it's really challenging. And that's something that's been really, really difficult with trying to um, coordinate uh, with the authorities and the government there. Um, I guess the good news, so sort of looking at it from it being a really big eruption um, and possibly the biggest eruption of the 21st century, is that there was minimal ash chemical hazards. So the leachates from the ash um, don't have a huge amount of uh, sulfur and chlorine and fluorine and things that can really impact on agriculture and drinking water. The pH uh, you know, wasn't too bad. Um, and there's been talk of the, the ash being used as a potential aggregate in Tonga, so a potential benefit because it's really hard to find good aggregate uh, on the islands. Um, and, you know, low casualties for such a violent event with um, so many associated hazards. Um, I guess those are the, um, you know, the two, sort of if you're trying to look at it from a positive light, but it is, yeah, it's, it's really impact on people. And it's going to be a long cleanup and huge impact for the people of Tonga, which you've got to really feel for. So uh, working uh, with the Tonga Geological Service um, and uh, people from Auckland, we've managed to get some images of some of the particles that came out of that eruption. Um, and this is really important, um, the particle sizes, particularly you know, for looking at rescue with helicopters and, and bits and pieces. It's quite a coarse deposit uh, and there's quite a range of particle types. There's you know, dense, um, really glassy looking things through to um, really light, pernicious looking material. Um, and when you look at this under the uh, scanning electron mic mic microscope, you can see um, the, the concave edges of bubbles and you can see evidence for um, this, this violent, brittle fracture. And you can also see very small bubbles in some of them. Um, so a huge range of textures and a huge range of particles. Um, We've started to get some um, geochemistry from the glass uh, and melt inclusions within crystals coming out of um, this deposit. Uh, and uh, we've just plotted it up here showing, uh, so the, the yellow, the 2022 eruption, the January 15th eruption, um, the blue here is 2009, and then the green is 2014-15, and the orange is the um, 1100 AD um, big caldera forming eruption. So you can see that the um, new magma that was erupted uh, this year is more primitive. It goes down to about 56% silica, so it's basaltic andesite essentially. And there seems to be multiple populations uh, of magma in here. Um, there is a more evolved version, which plots up here, which has a lot of microlites and collapsed bubbles within the glass. And then there's this less evolved population uh, which has these nice round bubbles and doesn't seem to have that, that microlite growth. Um, so there's potentially multiple um, magma systems and there's been some kind of re rejuvenation event from fresh magma coming from depth and interacting with this shallower system, um, which uh, nicely explains the sudden change in behavior of a volcano that was producing these sort of smaller sets of interruptions. Um, and this is consistent with looking at, um, these are the textures up here of the um, steady state um, Strombolian eruption, uh, sorry, so it's saying eruptions uh, in 2014, 2015, you can see lots of microlites and lots of collapsed bubble structures. This is the 1100 AD um, pumices, and you can see a similar texture to the stuff that just erupted with um, these rounder bubbles and less microlites in the ground mass. 
Um, so it's quite fascinating to see this. This was coming out um, about 10 days after the eruption. So um, University of Auckland really managed to get their microprobe working in time. So, I mean, coming out of this, uh, there's a huge number of questions that are remaining and uh, there's a lot of interest from volcanologists all around the world um, in trying to collaborate and combine data sets to try and answer some of these big questions, particularly around why did the volcano suddenly change behavior? behavior? You know, it was producing these sort of smaller volume um, eruptions. Why did it all of a sudden have this huge uh, event? Was it just magma recharge? Was it the fact that you submerged the vent and then water got deep into the system and opened it up? Um, and we're starting to think about what does this mean for future eruptions? Does it mean that everything's come out of the volcano and any future activity will be um, smaller eruptions? Uh, or is it gonna produce another big eruption, which is really important for, for dealing with future, um, future eruptions? Um, what's becoming quite clear is the extent of collapse and the processes that cause that collapse. Um, and I guess the, the main question is, was it caldera collapse or was it just flank collapse and part of the volcano um, sliding off? Um, it's quite clear that there potentially was a decent submarine landslide that was generated from this event. So we're starting to lean towards flank collapse, but I guess none of this will be known until we get a boat there to, to get the bathymetry. Um, we're starting to work out what the origin and timing and relationships are between the tsunami, the shock wave, and also um, the large amounts of seismicity. Um, so all different people are working together to try and um, timestamp videos, to try and look at um, seismic traces, to try and look at um, uh, pressure traces and all sorts of things. And it's uh, starting to give us a really good idea of the timeline and the exact sequence of events that happened. Um, in terms of what's next, um, monitoring would be good. Uh, there's not a single seismometer in Tonga, so we'd really like to try and get at least a seismometer on Tonga Tapu. Um, you know, be better than having something in BG, which is ages away. And there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the location of the earthquakes. Um, it would be quite logistically challenging to get a seismometer on what's left of the island, um, but that would be, of course, uh, ideal. Um, a follow-up survey, there's a lot of talk um, between particularly GNS and MIWA and um, some colleagues in the US around um, a voyage to try and get this bathymetry and um, around the volcano and also across the volcano, um, potentially some dives and getting an ROV there to look. Of course, that's quite challenging at the moment because of the health and safety issues of going across an area that's just collapsed and had a huge eruption. Um, there's a lot of paperwork to fill out if you, and a lot of uh, risk management. Um, and of course, uh, in sort of in the longer term, more geochemistry, um, dating of uh, the rocks and also correlations with TIF on the islands to see how often this happens, not only from Hunga, but also from uh, volcanoes all along Tonga in that area, which is extremely active. Um, and I just wanted to finish with um, a shameless bit of self-promotion uh, saying that if you're interested in explosive eruptions or you know any students that are wanting to study volcanoes, come to New Zealand. Uh, we've, got, we've just got three fully funded PhD projects. One of them is very, very relevant to what I've been talking about today. Um, it's uh, funded under a program called Beneath the Waves. Uh, which is a big um, government grant, which has been um, given to GNS and, and colleagues from universities in New Zealand to try and uh, assess the nearshore hazards um, from uh, nearshore volcanoes, um, such as uh, Fukari, uh, White Island, or Tuhua, Mayor Island as well, which have in their past had pretty decent eruptions. So we're doing uh, tsunami modeling, we're doing ash wall modeling from these volcanoes. We're also um, doing a whole bunch of sediment coring around the volcanoes try and look at their eruptive history in detail. Um, so that's a really exciting project uh, that hopefully will start later on in the year. Um, and then I have two other projects uh, associated with the Marsden grant that I was awarded last year, which is looking at the environmental and climate impacts of New Zealand super eruptions, in particular, these three big events that have happened over the last million years, where we have evidence in um, various um, environmental proxies like uh, marine cores and lake cores from around New Zealand where we have the, uh, the glass and the tephra within a horizon where we can look at the impacts on vegetation. 
We've also found the glass from the Aronui event in Antarctica. So there's uh, the potential there to look at the climate impacts of these huge eruptions, which are about 500 times the size of uh, the Hunger eruption. So just huge events. So if you know of any students or anyone that's interested in volcanoes, um, uh, they can get in contact with me or have a look at my website. Um, yeah. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, and I've just put up a little um, picture of Hanga Tonga, Hanga Ha'apai to say RIP. This island no longer exists, um, but it was a beautiful place. Um, and I thought I'd also share this, uh, this image that I found online, which is showing some of the magnificent sunsets you're getting over in Australia because of uh, the, the sulfur dioxide and the sulfate in the stratosphere. So yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>